to be with you today. Um, and it's very exciting for me to see so much attention being paid to robotics this web summit. I'm usually not, not used to that. So I've enjoyed all the panels and the presentations. And actually, I think this talk will help weave a lot of these themes together. So I'm also going to talk about robots. And again, just to acknowledge that we have had a very long, enduring fascination with this particular technology and it's a very special human connection to this kind of technology. When you think about not only our science fiction, I think this is a picture of like all recent science fiction robots ever, um, but even going back to ancient Greece, when you think about the god of Hephaestus as the blacksmith god creating maidens of gold who could sing or artifacts that could do work on their own, the idea of robots has been with us for, for many, many years. And it fascinates us in this human sense in that they're as we conceptualize them, they're like us, but then they're not quite like us. And because of that, through our stories, through our art, we hold them up as a mirror to ourselves to think about what is it to be human? What is the human experience? What kind of people do we want to become? And how tightly do we hold our, our convictions? So this was long before we could actually build technologies, build robots of, of this level of sophistication. But of course, we live in these exciting times that we've heard about. So thanks to Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, we certainly are in this period of exponential growth of computation. People like to draw analogies of computation power to some measure of brain power and show this exponential curve. The devices are getting networked, not only to connect people now, but to network devices. We have this profound growing amount of big data that we can use with modern advances in computational techniques, machine learning techniques, that we're now starting to address AI problems that have been very challenging for a long period of time, like face recognition, object recognition, speech recognition. And not only are they becoming tractable, they're being commercializable. So all of these trends, and it's not only that these AI technologies are being now closely, closely held to the vest within corporations, they're being democratized, they're being woven into developer platforms. So now other people can put in these advanced AI techniques into their software and services as well. So all of these things are happening. And of course, it makes you wonder, are we finally at this AI inflection point where there's going to be this rapid uh, uh, expansion of these technologies going forward? So we've heard about you know, the Internet of Things. And of course, because of all of this, it's not just about things being connected together. There are things that think being connected together and sense and communicate and learn and interact with us you know, projections of by the year 2020, 50 billion devices will be connected. This is certainly something that is noteworthy when we think about robots and technologies. When we think about the path to the home, you know, way back in 2002, the Roomba was introduced, right? So this was the idea now of an uh, appliance that has autonomy. So now it can vacuum for you. But it was really kind of a self-contained device, right? It wasn't connected to anything else. You know, in 2011, the Nest thermostat came out, so maybe you might call that a robot, maybe you might not, but certainly bringing machine learning, the ability to, to learn about your patterns of how you want to heat or cool your house, being able to learn a model for that, and also being connected to mobile apps so that you can interact with your thermostat when you're outside the ho house and see other kinds of data, but connecting it again to the outer web and internet of things. You know, we're seeing a big proliferation in intelligent assistant technology. So 2010, Siri was launched on the iPhone, really empowering uh, our relationship with information through a spoken interface. So having interfaces that are more human-like. And then, of course, when we look at Amazon Echo, it's taking that capability, bringing it to a different form factor in the home, where now you can engage it with far-field speech, and not only connecting that to information and services, but also connecting it to other devices in the home. So we see these trends happening. You know, so it's intriguing then to think about, you know, we live in this world where we are already know the cloud, the mobile services, the content, we have our family, we have this connected home. And then, of course, the question is, what about the robot? Where does the robot fit in with this growing ecology? And it's fascinating to ask the question, is there something special about the robot in terms of its relationship to the stuff and to the content, but also the relationship to the human beings, to the people of the home. And that's really what I want to talk about today. And there's this particular opportunity for this special kind of robot that's called a social robot. So this is a picture of me with Kismet. Kismet's recognized to be the world's first social robot. It was developed uh, as my dissertation at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab in 2000. 
And it was really, the, the idea behind Kismet really came to me on the day that NASA landed Sojourner on Mars. And I remember thinking, this is amazing. It was huge elation in the field of robotics. You know, knowing that we could put robots into the oceans to explore the oceans, into volcanoes, and all these amazing places, and now finally on Mars. But where are they in our homes? And realizing that no one was really seriously tackling that problem, and how different the home environment was to sending robots out into the world where it may deal with nature versus dealing with people who are a very different entity. Because our behavior is not just governed by the laws of physics. Our behavior is governed by having states of mind. So creating a robot that could really engage us in this way, understand us as special entities in the world, had really not been tackled. So one of the fascinating things about social robots, then, is it's not just about creating technologies that can sense and act and make decisions and collaborate, but it's also about thinking about what does it mean to create a technology that has social intelligence, that has emotional intelligence, that can recognize us and treat us as human beings. Um, and what we've discovered is that these social and these emotional attributes of this technology brings this sort of high-touch engagement with high tech for the first time. So when we think about our tools, like our apps, we get utility and usefulness for our tools, but we get a very different kind of help and experience from people. And it's intriguing to think of a technology that can start to bring or weave those two together. So to provide social support, to sustain this high touch engagement, things like being able to coach, to be able to tutor, to be able to engage, to motivate beyond just data, and actually how that can lead people to be more successful with this kind of technology than other forms. And I'm going to talk to you about a lot of studies we've done to show that. So the social emotive AI, you know, it's really thinking about the same kinds of topics in there that we always have, but putting this human-centered perspective on it. So being able to, of course, now perceive people, but in terms of their social and the emotive stage, in order to try to understand what their intent is. When we think about learning, it's not just about crunching big data sets offline, but how do you create a technology that's intuitive and easy for people to understand, but also appreciating that this is a collaborative process. When you're teaching a robot, you know, the person is in some sense guiding the robot's exploration, and the robot's behaviors can help give a sense to the person of what the robot understands that can guide the subsequent teaching. So it's this very tight feedback loop. When we think about expression, how the robot expresses itself naturally taps into the lot of psychological mechanisms we already have as people to get an inference, to be able to intuit, what does that other person think? What do they understand? How does that help me to predict what they're likely to do? How does that help build trust? So the expressive attributes of the robot, how that matches with our human social psychology is an intriguing question. And then, of course, all of the AI, the, AI, the decision making, to not only understand how to, to perform a task collaboratively with you, but how you do that in a way that builds rapport, builds that sense of team, that facilitates and improves the human functioning in that team so you can get even better performance of the human robot team. So it's a new kind of relationship. We've heard a lot of discussions and concerns and fears about you know, robots literally being a plug uh, replacement for people. And that's really, I don't think that's what's going on at all, nor should it. It's a different kind of relationship. And a lot of the studies that we've done, experimental studies we've done in my lab at MIT, has shown that it's taking attributes of the kind of social support that we can get from people. It's taking attributes of the kind of help or utility we can get from our tools. And it's even taking attributes of the kind of relationships we have with companion animals. It's, again, it's a new kind of relationship. And there is a... Um, an opportunity in that relationship to create a technology that can help us in ways that technology has never done before. So it's this humanized engagement leads to greater success with technology. And I'm going to illustrate that with just four examples to give you a sense of what that means. So social robots and human needs, right? If you do these sorts of things, you live a better quality life. You know, things like safety, health, emotional bond with your family, um, learning and growing. All these things are critical to our ability to succeed, thrive, and grow in life. So I'm going to give you some quick examples of how we've explored these in the context of social robots. So with safety, we looked at driving. We've heard a lot of talk about autonomous cars. This was done a number of years ago where Audi Volkswagen actually came to our group and said, you know, we want to figure out how we can help 
foster and facilitate the car driver or driver car emotional bond and their bond to the brand. And we know that you at MIT have been studying this sort of emotion, social aspect of humans and technology. Can you help us? So we, we thought about this question for a time, and we started actually thinking about the smartphone. And the smartphone, because obviously it's a technology that's with you quite a lot. It can already learn about you. It knows your contacts list, your playlist, your calendars, and so forth. If you created an agent app, maybe an Audi app on that smartphone, it might be a helpful assistant that could transcend from what you do in the car to life and back. A lot of opportunities there. Tons of apps around navigation and restaurants and so forth that that agent could bring to bear in the car. So it almost becomes like a car concierge, right? Um, but there was a downside, of course, because at the time also there was a lot of concern about people texting and driving and accidents and human safety was a big issue. So the thought was, what if you actually, when you came into your uh, car, you actually snapped your phone into a robot that's in the dash, and the robot can come up and can look at you, engage you socially, but then when you're driving, you can kind of recede back into the dash. So that was the idea. So this was IDA, stands for Effective Intelligent Driving Agent. And as we often do in our lab, we wanted to compare that with other kinds of interventions. So we have this social robot version of IDA, we did a study where you would just give people a regular phone with the apps, which is kind of what people were doing at the time. Or you could just have the IDA app sitting on the dash, but no robot associated with that. So we brought people into our lab. We had them do a driving simulator where they do a driving task. They had to run a number of errands on this simulated task. And we would purposefully interrupt them and give them distractors and basically try to make it as uh, cognitively uh, loaded time as we could make it and see how the interaction with these technologies would change. Where the idea with something like Ida was, again, as a car concierge, you may have this situation where Ida knows your calendar and knows the address of where you're going and who the meeting's with. And through the mapping app, it would know you're going to be 15 minutes late. So Ida would proactively say, you're going to be 15 minutes late to your next appointment. Do you want me to text Carlos, say, and let him know that you'll be late? So now all you have to say is, yes, Ida, that would be great. I can, can read back the response from Carlos, and you can focus on the driving. So that was the opportunity. Now, we did this simulation, and here's what we found. People actually drove more safely with the social robot than the other two conditions. They were less likely to speed. They ran through fewer stop signs. They had fewer collisions. So it's intriguing that the ability of this social interface appropriately designed to reduce the cognitive load of the person actually enabled them to be better drivers. The other thing we looked at was just quality of the driving experience. People rated the robot condition far more enjoyable. There was more evidence of positive effect. We videotaped them. We did questionnaires at the end. We analyzed their driving performance in the simulator. They scored the robot as more sociable and more co-present. So very intriguing to think about how a physical presence of an intelligent agent in the car actually led to a lot of positive outcomes for the driving experience and for driving performance. We've looked at health. So we've created uh, robots in our lab that basically serve as a personal health coach. We were actually looking for a domain where it was not only about long-term engagement, but where we knew social support really mattered. And in the area of behavior change around chronic disease management, social support is known to be very important. So we worked with Dr. Carolyn Povian, who's an expert in weight management at the, uh, Boston University Medical School. And we studied how she interacted with patients. We actually modeled that in a robot form. We created a dialogue model. The robot also had some simple social cues. It could make eye contact with you, with it spoke to you. It would look down at its screen to share attention on the information it would provide on its screen. You could speak to the robot. You could enter information onto the screen. And it basically acted as this virtual Carolyn Apovian health coach. Now, of course, this was never supposed to replace Dr. Apovian, but it was to give you that constant support 24 by 7 whenever you wanted it in the context of home versus just being able to see your doctor you know, once every few months or so. So we compared this to a computer that had the exact same software, got, got the exact same advice, the social robot with the social embodied cues, and then just a pen and paper log, which is what Dr. Apovian gives her patients. And what we found was that people actually engaged with the robot much more than the other interventions. And when you talk about something like uh, behavior change, it's really about the long-term engagement that matters. People can lose weight doing all kinds of crazy diets. It's keeping it off that's the hard part. So longer engagement was much higher with the robot. They scaled the robot as being, they trusted it more, 
and looking at standard psychological measures of the quality of teamwork using the Working Alliance Inventory, people scored the robot much higher than the computer, even though the quality of the information, the quality of the dialogue was exactly the same. So there's something about the physical social presence of the robot that really mattered. The emotional engagement of the robot was fundamentally different. They named the robot, they even dressed the robot, and their you know, favorite sporting team paraphernalia. Uh, and in many cases, they didn't want us to come get the robot when the study was done. So again, this emotional connection was fascinating. We've looked at social robots in the context of telepresence. So we know FaceTime. The question was, well, so what if you gave the remote person a greater physical social expressiveness versus just something on a screen? So we did a study where we compared just a FaceTime mobile app on the screen, a robot that just could do mobility with the screen, much like you see telepresence robot today, and this fully expressive version that would allow you to gesture to lead in. So it's your face and your voice, but with this physical presence. We had people come into the lab. We did an experiment on a collaborative task. And we found that with the robot condition, people had greater empathy for the person on the other side. They had greater psychological involvement. They reported greater engagement and greater liking of the interaction over the other two uh, conditions. And in the con context of learning, we've been doing a lot of work actually creating these social robots as learning companions for children. And I think as you can see in this picture, there's a different emotional engagement of children with a social robot as a learning companion than with an app with activities. So we often have these robots perform these or play these educational apps with a child, but much more modeling a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And when you model this peer-to-peer -peer interaction, you see lots of benefits. So the robot in, say, a storytelling context would weave targeted vocabulary words into its story and be able to personalize its story to the child. And we're able to show that children actually have much better learning outcomes when you do the personalization and the social interaction. We've even looked at attitudes towards learning. So having a robot exhibit pro-curiosity behaviors, things like if the robot makes a mistake, to say, that's OK, that's how I learn. We're able to show that children are able to pick up on that, and they exhibit greater curiosity behaviors as well. So being able to shape attitudes the way that you can in an interpersonal relationship is fascinating. So the bottom line, again, is in all these different contexts, and these kinds of studies are being done all over the world in a highly rigorous scientific way, people seem to be doing better with these social robots, again, with these other kind of uh, more traditional screen-based interventions. So what's the new story then for robots? You know, we think about robots today still, the value proposition often centers around being this sort of um, uh, uh, physical work technology. But we've been able to see through these studies and more, there's actually this aspect of the uh, humanized engagement is kind of the, the killer skill. So we have robots that can do dexterity, drive cars, and do like stuff like that. We have uh, robots that can do specific tasks, kind of niche, vacuum cleaning, uh, lawn mowing. We've seen entertainment robots. But when you think about robots as a new kind of expressive medium, then you can imagine for the first time a robot can do many, many things for you. And that's very exciting. So that was the kind of insight, the kind of meta, so to speak, that led to the formation of Jibo, which is uh, a company that is going to be launching this product next year. And it is conceived to be this helpful companion that brings flat content to life with this greater humanized engagement because you can be more effective that way. So I'm going to show you this a little video is your house. of Jibo. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things, but these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo. Take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him, and he'll talk to you back, so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. 
he's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that. Hey, they make turkey pizza. I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jibo. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell, nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. Good night, Jibo. Jibo, this little bot of mine. Right, so that's Jibo. And just quickly, thank you. <laughs> thank you. To wrap up, oh, let's go to the next slide. So again, Jibo's a platform. So our challenge at Jibo is to create a SDK that gives you as developers access to these unique affordances of social robots to bring this enlivened, humanized interaction into your apps and services. And through that, through our developers and our community, we're learning of all kinds of applications that people are very excited about. Educational, playful learning for kids, helping moms and dads with new babies around photo capture, health information, huge potential around aging in place, and a lot of excitement around the connected home. So where is this all going? I really see this as the next evolution as we think about computing. Today, you know, we think about technology today, it's been largely thought of as a tool we're democratizing information. It's a lot about data, data, data. In this talk, though, I've talked about these other domains where this high-touch engagement is absolutely critical for the best possible human outcomes, things like elder care, health, learning. It's interesting to think about social robots as, again, bringing this humanized engagement to our technology to support the democratization of access to much more personalized, humanized services. And again, a lot of this really comes from a position of, we want to create technologies that promote human flourishing. There's a belief that social robotics can do that in a way that no other technology has done to date. And I think that's the exciting opportunity we all want to see happen and to bring to the world. Thank you. Great.